Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Spring 2018 Speech Night. If you're uh, still coming in, please try to come in and find a seat. But I want to welcome you all. My name is Brian Guy. I'm the, one of the directors of the speech and debate team here at Modesto Junior College. And I hope to present you all with a fantastic show this evening. I just have a couple of clerical things to take care of before we get started. So first off, if you are doing this as part of a class requirement, most professors require that students fill out one of these critique sheets that they had out front. It has two sides to it. On the front, there are some boxes for you to list the preliminary speakers during the first half of the show. So during the first 40 minutes of the program, you're going to watch four very talented individuals come up and give three different types of presentations. Go ahead and write their names, the type of speech that they gave, the topic, and then based on how you thought you did compared to uh, other college, uh, college speakers, give them a one through four rank, one being best, four being yeah, hopefully mostly uh, most mostly ones in this, uh, in this event. During the second half of the evening, we will be presenting to you all a parliamentary style debate. And my MCs will tell you more about that. The parliamentary style debate is really exciting because it's a limited preparation form of debate, meaning that the debaters that are debating tonight don't have any idea what they're debating about or even which side of the topic they're going to be on. So halfway through the speeches, they'll come up, they'll get their topic, and they should put a good show on you after that. But during that debate, we have to summarize their arguments as well as at the end, you'll get a chance to both vote on your critique form and we'll do an audience poll so we see how they uh, how they do. Well, folks, I'm really excited to see you all tonight. Thank you all for coming uh, coming out. The Manessa Junior College Speech and Debate Team has been in existence almost as long as NJC has. We got our start the year after NJC was founded, which means that NJC Speech and Debate is also coming up on 100 years of the competition. So over the last century, Modesto Junior College debaters have competed all over the country, and the individuals that you're going to see tonight continue that uh, history of excellence. We travel to tournaments all over the state of California. Later this year, we're going to be going all the way to Florida for nationals, and we're really, uh, really excited to kind of show you what some of your fellow competitors at uh, Modesto Junior College are capable of. One of the things that I like to mention is that many of the folks on this stage tonight started in the exact same place that you are tonight. They came to watch a speech night debate, and they said, you know what? I could do that, or I want to do that. They came, they joined our squad, and went on to do amazing things. So, after the program tonight, if this is something that seems exciting and interesting to you, come talk to me or any of the folks on my staff or on my team, and they'd be excited to tell you about Modesto Junior College speech and debate. Well, in a second here, I'm going to turn the floor over off to my co-director of forensics, Professor Tori Shent, to introduce you to the team, but I just want to do a couple of quick thank yous before we get started. First off, a big set of thank yous to my team team for all of the hard work. They've been at this all day trying to get a fantastic show ready for you all to watch. I want to thank the Com City's faculty for all of their support of our uh, of our team. A big shout out to the administration, particularly our Dean Mike Sunquist, who has consistently been a supporter of our team. We really, really appreciate that. Um, and finally, I want to say thank you to my coaches, uh, Professor Tori Shemp and Eric Fuentes, putting countless hours of their time above and beyond to get folks ready for competition. I I couldn't do any of this without them, so please give a big round of applause. Without any further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Professor Tori Shemp to introduce you all the Modesto Junior College Speech and Debate Team. Please enjoy the show. to silence it so it doesn't go off during the presentations tonight. Uh, all right, please help me in welcoming your spring 2018 Modesto Junior College speech and debate team. First, we have Austin Castro.
two trusty MCs, Tyree Jones and Kendra McKinley. And I'm Tyler Jones. And we are very excited to be your hosts tonight. We're very excited that everyone is here. Thank you so much for coming. Our first speaker today will be Taylor Coburn. It is her third semester on the team, and she's a communication studies major. A fun fact about her is that her favorite food is potatoes. And um, for one moment, please, if anybody is in the aisle sitting down, can you please find a seat within any of the areas, please? Really appreciate it. If you have an open seat sitting next to you, there's an empty seat, please raise your hand so folks can find out where to go. See all those seats? Please uh, please move them to the floor. It's a fire code. Thank you all. Hi, you guys are all mad you got to get up. Don't be shy, you're not gonna bite. Come on, y'all, raise them hands high. I know y'all getting tired. Go ahead and raise them hands, shake them. Go ahead and let people know you got an NPC next to you. There you go, there you go. <laughs> All right, guys, now that everybody's finding their seat, let's just start from scratch. <laughs> Our first speaker today, her name is Taylor Coburn. It is her third semester on the team. She is a communication study major, and a fun fact about her is that she, her favorite food is potatoes. I like french fries, and I would like to debate anybody about Popeye's being the best fries. <laughs> Uh, Taylor actually will be performing an impromptu speech, and she will have two minutes to prepare a well-organized and insightful speech. She must choose uh, one of three topics to speak about. And it's also especially important that the audience uh, please be quiet while she has her prep time. She will have seven minutes to prepare for a speech. All right, so without further ado, please give a round of applause for Taylor. seconds used. Not too long. 
long ago, one of my favorite authors in the entire world won the Carrie Lansing Award for Leadership. Now, she was credited with this award for being someone who broke the glass ceiling in the industry. Now, she didn't understand why she was getting this award. She said that she never felt like she was breaking through the glass ceiling because she never had any cuts, she never had any bruises, she never hit anything hard enough. But then she realized that she needed to credit it to every single person who went before her. I was reminded of that when I received the quotation today, that walking with a friend in the dark is better than walking alone in the light, by Helen Keller. And I interpreted this to mean that it is important to have people in your life who build you up. And I completely agree with this quotation, and we're going to talk about it through that of Leslie Nope, Sophie Germain, and Harry Potter. So first, let's turn on our televisions and talk about the brilliant Leslie Nope. Now, um, Leslie Nope is a character from the show Parks and Recreation, and it's played by Amy Poehler, and it basically follows the story of a woman who is in local government. Now, Leslie is the most optimistic person, probably in the entire world, and um, she just knows that she wants to do something amazing for her, for her town. Now, she has so much pride in her little town, even though that it's nothing super exciting. It's um, called Pawnee, and it is just this very small town that no one really pays attention to. But she has so much pride and love for it that she just wants to give her town the best things that they can possibly have. So, time and time again, people always tell her no, whether or not she wants to build a park, whether she wants to run for city council. Um, people always um, put her down and tell her that it's impossible. But she has this group of friends, whether it's um, Ron Swanson or Ben or April, she has this whole entire group of people around her that are constantly building her up. And because of that, she is able to experience so many things. These people become her campaign managers. They become the people who are saying that she can do anything no matter what. And because of the people that she has around her, she is able to con conquer so much in her lifetime. Next, let's talk about Sophie Germain, and we'll take a blast from the past. So Sophie Germain is um, actually a mathematician, and she was born in the time of the French Revolution. Now, um, Sophie, because she was born in the time of the French Revolution, she was actually pretty wealthy, which made her an extreme target. So to combat this, her parents locked her in the house, and she was not allowed to leave her home. So being in the house all the time made her kind of bored. So she had the story of Archimedes that she came across in the library. Now, if you don't know the story of Archimedes, Archimedes loved mathematics so much that he even died for mathematics. And when she came across this story, she was so inspired by his story um, because he was so infatuated with mathematics that he was willing to die for it. So she decided that she was going to pursue mathematics no matter what. Um, her parents ultimately tried to stop her. And because it was at a time where it was believed that, that if women tried to comprehend these um, big ideas, that their minds would literally go insane. But she ended up just pursuing it no matter what and going for it. And because of that, she was able to, finally her parents let her and she was allowed to go and practice mathematics and do what she loved. But she wouldn't have been able to do that if she didn't have her parents in her life and the story of Archimedes in her life that pushed her to keep going. Finally, let's dive into the wizarding world of Harry Potter and talk about a certain character in Harry Potter that I like to call Hermione. Now, Hermione is um, someone in the Harry Potter series who pretty much values education over everything. Now, it's in the first movies that she is seen as someone who is kind of, you know, crude and stuck up, that she really only values education. But along the way, she decides that education isn't the biggest thing. Um, education and knowledge isn't the biggest thing, but it's actually friendship. And the very first movie, she says, or worse, expelled, or dying. Now, in this mindset, she believed that uh, that dying was even less bad than edu or than uh, being expelled was. And because of that, um, she had this whole entire mindset that education was everything. But later on, she decided to open herself up to friendship. And she realized that no matter what, friendship was the most important thing. And because of that, she gained a whole entire new family through these friends, through Harry Potter and Ron and Neville and Luna. She gained this whole entire new family. And because of that, they were able to do amazing things for the wizarding world. So today, I received the quotation, Walking with a friend in the dark is better than walking alone in the light by Helen Keller. And I interpreted this to mean that you need people around you to build you up in order to be able to conquer amazing things. That what we should be looking at is the people in our lives. We looked at it through Leslie Nope and her um, friends building her up and her doing amazing things for her town. 
We looked at it through Sophie Germain and learning from the story of Archimedes and also from her parents. And we looked at it through Hermione and um, finding friendship in the most unlikely places. Now, with this, it's important that you see that there are things around you, that there are people who went before you, that there are people who are constantly building you up, because those people can change your life. Let me turn it back over to my MCs. If you didn't get a critique form, just raise your hand real quick, and Professor Adair and Adams and Shemp will, uh, will bring you one. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of the show. Great job, Taylor. I mean, she literally had to figure out that whole speech in a minute and 45 seconds. It is extremely difficult, and she just did an awesome job, so... of the day is Bingley Coleman. This is her third semester on the team. Uh, she's a communication study major. Uh, a fun fact about her is she loves cats and she can play up to five instruments. Please give her a round of applause. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> She'll be being, uh, performing an informative speech. This is a speech that focuses on new scientific discoveries, mental medical breakthroughs or technology developments. So now, let's give a big round of applause for Bailey Coleman. I have a confession. When I was a kid, I had a very misguided understanding about what robots were. Specifically, I was under the misconception that robots were tiny little machines with paddles for arms that would steal boats and literally row around the open seas. I was very disappointed the first time I watched Futurama. Seriously, how could this guy be a robot? Think about it. He doesn't even have a paddle. So, you can only imagine my excitement when a 2015 article reported that scientists at Bristol University had created the world's very first actual robot. So I'm here today to tell you about the robot, a revolutionary breakthrough in aquatic pollution removal. So first, we'll plug in some background information, then we'll launch into the water to navigate some applications, and finally we'll explore some implications. So let's dive into some background information. There are two key things to understand about how the robot functions. Its biological basis and its self-sufficient design. The creators of the robot sought to take some of the best biologically derived traits and incorporate them into an engineered machine. As a result, the robot is modeled off of two living organisms, the basking shark and the water boatman beetle. The engineers replicated the movements of these creatures in their basic biological systems. Thus, the robot is composed of three parts. A brain in the form of a simple learning computer, a body in the form of four legs that sit upon the surface tension of the water, and a stomach, capable of digesting materials to power the whole system. These components allow the robot to move through its environment as if it were a creature that had evolved to survive there. Now the robot is also self-sufficient. The key to its recharging abilities lies in an innovative power source called microbial fuel cells, or MFCs for short. MFCs require two ingredients to work, oxygen and garbage. Carlos Santoro explains in a 2017 article from the Journal of Power Sources that this produces power that keeps the robot searching for more food. The robot digests pollution in the water, which produces electrons, thus pushing its paddles to move through the water and collect more pollution. So basically, it glides across the surface of the water, opens its mouth, eats up some waste, closes its mouth, and then after just a short amount of time of digesting, starts up the whole process again. David Neal explains in a 2015 Science Alert article that the energy it creates actually exceeds the energy it needs. This means that there is energy left over to send reports on its progress or even coordinate the best place to grab a snack with some other robots. As Jonathan Rossner discusses in his 2015 TED Talk, this ability to communicate allows current robots to be more effective and sets up a framework in which future swarms of self-adapting bots could work together to clean and preserve large bodies of water. Now, don't get me wrong. 
a small army of adorable, trash-collecting robots sounds like something right out of a Pixar movie, but the applications here are very real. We live on a planet that is covered in water, and as a species, we are dependent on that water in a multitude of ways. This is why the pollution of our oceans, lakes, rivers, and wetlands is so concerning. According to an article by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in July of 2017, our current struggles with water pollution come from a variety of sources, including industrial waste, wastewaters, mining activities, oil leakages, and the burning of fossil fuels. These pollutants can have a detrimental effect on the living organisms in the water, and through the delicate balance of ecosystems, the rest of life on the planet. According to an article by the National Geographic in May of 2017, Industrial wastes and other contaminants are being dumped untreated into waters across the globe with more frequency and toxicity. So even though you may think that the sheer abundance of water on this planet could withstand some pollution, at this rate, our water sources are on the brink of suffering permanent contamination they may never recover from. This is where the robot could literally save the planet. Now currently the robot is being used in a couple of key ways. Our wetlands are one of the most ecologically sensitive places on the planet. Pollution from agriculture, mining, and wastewaters have put these areas at extreme risk. According to the National Wetland Condition Assessment, a report prepared by the EPA on August 10, 2017, U.S. wetlands are experiencing catastrophic failures as attempts at preservation have been unable to keep pace with the contaminants that are entering these ecosystems. Now, when the living organisms in, in these wetlands are wiped out by these contaminants, it causes two problems, soil loss and evaporation. In fact, researchers at MIT released a report in 2014 that argued that wetland loss in New Orleans greatly contributed to the amount of flooding that took place during Hurricane Katrina. In contrast, a journal article published by the journal Nature on August 31st, 2017 argues that New Jersey's efforts to restore wetlands resulted in over $625 million worth of decreased property damage during Hurricane Sandy. So, as we continue to pick up the pieces from hurricanes like Harvey, Irma, and Maria, it has become painfully apparent how critical it is to deploy new means to protect these areas. Additionally, the creators of the robot are testing a model designed for severe weather and even oceanic use. These modified robots are built to withstand harsher waters and weather conditions. This has led to the development of new MFCs with increased specialization of food sources. Henry Fillimore, one of the head researchers on the robot, states in a 2015 Wired magazine article that the goal is to have reactors that can digest oil from oil spills, harmful algae blooms like we saw last summer, and even that giant island of plastic that is currently floating around our Pacific Ocean. So, now that we understand some of the robot's current abilities, let's take a look at some limitations and future developments of this technology. First, a few current limitations. Now, as we've discussed, this robot could be absolutely key to reducing water pollution. However, with the scale of the problem, a comprehensive solution to this crisis could only be possible if a massive amount of robots were released into the natural environment. Now, some researchers are also looking into the possibility that technology like this could be made to be self-replicating, specifically using the excess energy from the MFC reactors and materials in the environment to be able to make copies of themselves. Now, while cute little robots might fill you with awe or leave you very worried if you've seen any science fiction movies, there is a far more practical consideration. Right now, these robots are not made of materials that are 100% biodegradable. With all of the wires and motors and typical parts of a robot, they would all have to be tracked down and collected after finishing their job. Otherwise, we risk replacing one form of pollution with another and potentially interfering with the natural environment of all the living organisms already in the water. But the good news is, the most dangerous part of the robot is already biodegradable. A 2015 article by the Journal of Chemistry and Sustainability states that the development of biodegradable microbial fuel cells is able to produce useful power. And then, after operating in remote ecological systems, they can harmlessly degrade into their surroundings, leaving no trace when their mission is complete. Additionally, scientists have recently made major breakthroughs in new forms of biodegradable circuitry. Researchers in California published the results of a fully biodegradable circuit in the April 2017 issue from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Discoveries like this make future solutions promising. 
but fall short of addressing current applications. This current scientific limitation prohibits the number of robots that could be released. In the meantime, they will have to be equipped with homing beacons. Fillmore states in the aforementioned Wire Magazine article that the researchers are looking into the possibility of equipping these robots with a means to bring themselves home. So basically a cute, hard-working robot that comes home at the end of the day. What more could you want from these robots? So today, we learned about Bristol University's robot. First, we plugged in some background information, then we launched into the water to navigate some applications, and finally hop back out of the water and explore some implications. To the disappointment of my inner child, I guess I'll never completely see my dream of Trixie robots running around on not a put crime sprees materialize, but I can still hope, right? And now, can we have the four debaters please come up? At this time, we will go ahead and let the debaters know what they will be de debating about and which team they will be on, whether it be the affirmative, which means they're voting basically yes, or the opposition, which will be negative, voting against. Alrighty, my trusty co host will go ahead and do the coin flip. It's a head. We'll pick up. All right, so you guys will be the affirmative, you guys will be the opposition, and your re resolution will be California Community Colleges should stop offering remedial courses. All right, you guys. Good luck, guys. See you soon. <laughs> So, while they are prepping that out, our next speaker will be Austin Castro. This is his third semester on the team. He's a cinema and television arts major. A fun fact about him is that both him and his friend Tristan, who is also on the team, were both contestants on The Price is Right, and they both won. Tonight, I'm going to be performing a persuasive speech which is designed to change an audience's belief or to move them to some sort of action. So, Austin Castro, come, come on down! down. Yeah. 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 In the Coachella Valley School District, students were recently equipped with iPads to help with schoolwork in class and at home. The purpose of this was to help reduce inequity and increase access to the digital resources available to students online. The only problem, however, was when a large portion of these students arrived home, they had no way to connect to the internet. The district quickly scrambled to find a solution, and after countless meetings, they decided to equip school buses with mobile Wi-Fi repeaters. These school buses would then be parked in students' homes overnight just so they could complete their homework assignments. Needless to say, this was a largely costly and ineffective endeavor. The problem, however, is a very real one. The FCC released a report in early 2017 that showed 10% of Americans and 39% of rural Americans lack basic access to the internet. Even those who had some connectivity only did so at dial-up speeds prohibiting them from accessing a vast majority of the modern internet. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. Oh no, these people can't even stream Netflix. Hashtag first world problems. <laughs> but in reality, this lack of access puts serious limitations on business, health, and education opportunities. Thus, I am here to convince you that it is time for us to close the digital divide and provide equal internet access to all Americans. So first, we will dial into our ISP to look at the problem. Wait for our causes to load before finally getting frustrated and calling up tech support for some solutions. The digital divide is a serious problem with troubling implications. Urban cities on the west and east coast have faster reliable internet connections. However, Alfred Ng explains in a 2016 CNET article that 6 million Americans living in rural Midwest states 
operate at speeds below 3 megabits per second, or lack access altogether. This has troubling implications for the education, health, and economic outcomes of these communities. Slow internet drives inequality between wealthy metropolitan schools and rural ones. The FCC recommends 10 megabits per second for a small family of three. But many schools are trying to serve hundreds of students at far slower speeds. Dan Nunty points out in a 2016 Wired article that this prevents students from being able to take a virtual tour, stream a video, or take online classes that their district doesn't offer. Additionally, broadband can be a key gateway to a number of healthcare services as well. Many rural communities with the greatest need for healthcare also have the most limited broadband access and thus the most limited access to healthcare providers online. For example, telemedicine allows doctors to pop into clinics by video. However, a 2016 CBS News article points out that the internet at rural clinics is simply too slow and unreliable. Finally, the digital divide disproportionately affects employment opportunities. Those who suffer from the digital divide have trouble searching and filling out job applications and gaining new career skills. In a Pew Research poll conducted in 2016, it found that 52% of respondents stated that lack of access to the internet put them at a major disadvantage. These issues reflect deeper issues of systemic racism. A 2016 study from the Public Interest Group Free Press states, there's no doubt that structural discrimination has a direct effect on the digital divide. A 2017 Vice News article quantified this disparity, stating that, while well, 70% of whites, but only 65% of blacks and 61% of Hispanics have home internet access. Thus, the digital divide disproportionately affects people of color with millions of Americans having to deal with what is a real-life 404 error, we have to take a look at the causes to see why that is the case. So, why does the U.S. have slow internet? Limited competition and FCC lobbying are just two of the reasons that contribute to this problem. Many homes, especially in rural areas, only have access to a single internet service provider, also known as an ISP. Because of this, ISPs have little incentive to drop prices or improve service. Rafi Lutcher points out in a 2016 Business Insider article that ISPs operate as monopolies in most of the country. For example, in Chicago's Rogers Park neighborhood, Comcast is the only broadband option. Even now, in 2018, the vast majority of rural America still lags behind the rest of the developed world. It seems impossible that, in this modern era, regulatory efforts to increase access would have failed to make any significant inroads to this problem. To better understand why that is the case, we have to take a look at how the powerful telecommunications lobby has managed to thwart attempts to solve this inequality. Since the early 90s, major ISPs have been lobbying Congress and the FCC to pass policies in their favor. Chris Mills explains in a 2016 VGR article that since 2008, Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, and the National Cable and Telecommunications have spent $572 million in lobbying. That's more than the defensive, banking, and automotive industries over the same period. Because of their intensive and effective lobbying, this gives them close to unlimited control over their business models. This has allowed a handful of the most powerful corporations to grow into monopolies. It's time we rethink how we deliver internet in the United States. Now that we understand the causes behind this problem, the solutions can't be delayed. Sorry, I was buffering. <laughs> so, how can we solve America's low internet problem? Well, historically, the internet has been treated as a premium service, like cable TV. But it's time for us to start treating it as a utility, like water and electric. Tim Sandel points out in a 2016 NBC News article that even the United Nations believes that online freedom and internet access are a basic human right. The July 2016 UN resolution stresses applying a comprehensive human rights-based approach when providing and expanding internet, and for the internet to be open, accessible, and nurtured. We can try rolling out internet the same way we rolled out electricity, 
almost a century ago. And that was by spreading to rural areas through co-ops. A 2017 story from Vox by Max Schneider proposes a solution from the past. In 1935, President Roosevelt made a push for electricity to reach the homes of millions of rural Americans. He created the REA, which led federal funding to electric co-ops, which are jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprises. Within just a couple of decades, all of America had access to electricity. Using this method is just one of the ways we can expand access. Government regulation can be a powerful force in expanding this access as well. The Telecommunications Act of 1996, which has encompassed American telecommunication law, is in desperate need of rewriting as it approaches 22 years since the initial act. A 2017 article from a quote by Richard Abbott points out how it's time to update this vital act and support the modernization of telecom. Talk to your local representative about making this change happen at the FCC. To do that, you can visit house.gov to find your representative and contact them to make this change happen. Additionally, you can also visit fcc.gov to see information on the extent to which the digital divide deeply affects us all. So today, we talked about the digital divide that America faces even in 2018. Second, we discussed how causes such as monopolies and lobbying are the root of this problem. And finally, we finished off with a few solutions on how we can expand access. So, let's work together to level the playing ground, close the digital divide, and provide equal internet access to all, including the students of Coachella Valley who are just trying to finish their homework. speaker is Kaylee Inman. This is her fourth semester on the team. She's a communications major. And a fun fact about her, she's a mother of two, two cats, and a turtle. She will be performing a POI piece, which is an oral interpretation. It's a combination of both poetry and prose, and it's designed to make the audience feel something. It's very powerful. So everyone, let's give it up for Kaylee. based on true events. Go 100 miles per hour down a 50 mile per hour highway. Start a car chase with the police. But make sure to stop at your local Starbucks drive through first and stock up on caffeine because this is gonna take a while. Steal a donut from 7-Eleven and hand it to a police officer. But <laughs> make sure to tell him that you stole it first. Run through the city naked. <laughs> Don't stop when you hear the yelling. Don't stop when you hear the sirens. Because this is what a convict really looks like. As of 2017, there are more than 110,000 women currently imprisoned in the United States, a dramatic increase over the last 20 years. Recently, we've seen more and more depictions of women's experience in prison through programs such as Orange is the New Black and Wentworth. While this increase of focus is beneficial, many of these fictional accounts leave out the practical struggles and systematic institutionalization that occurs in the real world. According to a 2017 study by the Vera Institute of Justice, 98% of incarcerated women have experienced physical abuse, 75% have experienced sexual abuse, and 85% have experienced emotional abuse. As the daughter of a woman who has been a victim of the prison system, it is imperative that we examine the effects and atrocities that institutionalization and abuse has on the individual psyche. Through this program, we can grasp the harrowing nature of prison life and realize the power and ability we have to resist and change the current system. Through the poetry, How to Get Arrested by Spark Poetry, Resist Dehumanization by Tamika Summers, and through the prose, Women Behind the Bars by Lauren Zunina. A program for my mother to shine light on her darkest of times. I was six months pregnant because she was cheery and munching toddler in a grocery cart. We stopped by the photo lab to pick my Christmas photos and we kept shopping. 
It was a lot of rice and lentils back in those days. <laughs> a lot of ramen noodles. I spent $42 on the week's groceries and left the store. And on the way out, the security guard stops me and asks to check my diaper bag and, and pulls out the Christmas photos that I forgot to pay for. I apologize profusely and offer to pay for them. And, and he just chuckles his $8 an hour chuckle and says, you have a chance to pay for them when you come with me. He escorts me to the monitor room with groceries left in cart, baby girl on him, and I notice myself in the monitor. I'm wearing my favorite denim maternity top and cropped pants. I'm startled by how responsible I look. You might want to call somebody to pick up your kid. I'd hate for DHS to take him. No, you don't understand. I, I, I can't go back to jail. I don't do that anymore. I am resistant of the brainwashing of the prison institution. Nothing is as it should be. I will not succumb to the dehumanizing pollution because within me, I am free. I am not lost, nor will I lose me, nor will I allow anyone to use or abuse me. Bring a Nerf gun to the airport. When they ask you where you have it, respond with, I was going to repay the movie non-stop, then <laughs> casually play it off by talking about Liam Neeson with the security guard before he, you know, arrests you. Dress up like Santa Claus on Christmas Eve and tie a beard to your bike. When the officer questions why you have it, respond with, you're going on the naughty list. Swear on a public bus. Tell that elderly lady to have a, you know what. <laughs> when my mother gets there, the cop is a woman, and I think maybe she'll have some sympathy. She just throws me in the back of the cop car and tells me she won't cuff me if I don't start acting crazy. By the time I get to county, my cheeks are striped with mascara and I'm watched over from the exhaustion of weeping. A woman, just a little bit older than me, sits down next to me and says, Honey, you can't worry like that. It's gonna upset the baby. Her name's Sonia. She has two gold front teeth, a sparkle in her eye, and the sweetest giggle when she talks about the food is first. I don't tell her that I know all about the food in this place, that this is my third time here. I, I, I wanted to think that I don't belong. I used to steal stuff a lot when I was a kid. I used to sell coke in a girl's bathroom. I always thought that if I could get high enough, I could escape the pain. I am not a victim of circumstance. I am a victor, and this is my big chance. With fire, I dance, but it's an elegant waltz, because I learned in advance how to dwell on my faults. This story's not pain. I'm white. I am three times less likely to be incarcerated than that of a black woman. But let's say for a second that I'm not. That my grandpa's not an attorney, but the charges weren't dropped. Let's say for a second that I'm Sophia. That I used to have a good job working at the factory, making $10 an hour, until that factory moved to Thailand while they worked for two. So, so I start selling weed on the side, because we had never heard nobody not like cocaine did. And, and I'm just going to the grocery store. I can't afford no Christmas pictures, and I got my baby girl in the back seat. My head lights out, my tax are expired, and the cop pulls me over. And he asks me to get out of my car so he can search it for a bit, and, and I just picked up a quarter pound so he's got me on a tip to distribute. Who is going to take care of my baby? My mom still hates me because my stepdad likes me better, and my baby's daddy only calls me when he's drunk, and I am trying to do right. I go to church. I have been saved three times, but who is going to save me now? It's so easy to get arrested for minor infractions. It's as easy as building a clock in a pencil case. You show your teacher and she thinks it's a bomb. 
Don't talk back or make any sudden movements. Your hands will surely be behind bars. Hours pass by, ticking away the time that you've been punished for creating a masterpiece. Maybe they won't think that it's a bomb, but that you are explosives and your, your, your culture is slammable. Live underneath the poverty line. It should be easy when the equator already split this world into two unequal halves. Africa and South America were not given an option. It's funny how we call it the equator when it knows nothing of equality. When will this world stop seeing in black and white? So, you want to get arrested? Inside myself, I live in an entirely different world. My life could safely wave on a shelf. They tell me that I'm nothing and that at no time will I succeed. But I know one thing. Nothing doesn't breathe or bleed. So I must be something. Something special. Be anything but fair-skinned. It's unfair that no matter what we do, we will get queen-sized beds instead of metal cops, TVs instead of radio sets. Prison workers will treat us like equals and other inmates like failures. Failures that didn't choose the right way to live. But it's hard to choose when you live in a place that dictates you're always guilty. American penitentiaries are like giant recycling bins. Throwing broken kids in and letting money fly out. Throwing broken kids in and families lose a child. Throwing broken kids into a suffocating jail cell. And broken kids never learn to apologize for breaking the law. The prison system profits from incarcerating you and will add another zero to the end of another lawyer's bank account and any excuse will do unless, <laughs> unless you're Justin Bieber or Lindsay Lohan or me. <sighs> Sometimes the easiest way to get arrested is to do nothing. They sentenced me to eight years, declared me wrong, declared me unfit, declared me not me. I am your evening entertainment. The longer that you are afraid of me, the easier it is to sell you on an industry. Because I'm finally working again, making 22 cents an hour for the state. This story is pain because it is all too common for hundreds of thousands of Oklahoma families. For every 100,000 people, 124 are incarcerated. Of those 75 committed nonviolent crimes, this number will just keep rising. The rest will just keep shopping. I am resistant to the brainwashing of the prison institution. I will not become institutionalized. Within me, I have the solution to resist being dehumanized. That was amazing, Kaylee. Thank you so much. All right, so now it's time to bring out our debaters. Yeah. I will be introducing the negative team. First, we have Sean Cox Marcelin. This is his, he's the leader of opposition. This is his fourth semester on the team, and he is an economics major. A fun fact about him is that he doesn't have a fun fact. His partner, Zoe Dubeck. This is her second semester on the team. She's a communication study major. A fun fact about Zoe is that she always wears super high heels to be taller than all of her male components. Thank you for that information. I'll make sure to never stand next to you. <laughs> and I will be uh, introducing the affirmative team. Uh, first, we have the prime minister, which is Lydia Sembria. This is her second semester on the team. Uh, she's a natural science major, and a fun fact about her is she can play the piano, the guitar, and sing. And she can also change a tire under 20 minutes. So fellas, we're gonna step the game up. Cancel that triple A. <laughs> <laughs> now for the, our leader of opposition, Sean. Or up for us, excuse me. Uh, Abel, Zabrano. This is his fourth semester on the team. He's an engineering major, and a fun fact about him is that Sean stole his fun fact. 
So you guys got to explain this to me. All right? Now, at this time, we would like to remind the audience that what's cool about a parliamentary debate is that it's really interactive with the audience. So if you hear anything that you really like uh, on the armrest right over next to you, you just give it a good but if you hear something that you absolutely agree with, you love, and you want to shout out to the heavens, <laughs> you'll just yell, here, here. Hey. Let's take a practice. So on the count of three, we'll all shout, here, here. One, two, three. Here, here. Great job. Okay, good, guys. <laughs> all right, now I recognize the leader of opposition, Sean. Oh, actually, I recognize the Prime Minister Lydia for a constructive speech, not to exceed four minutes. exciting debate room. So with that said, um, I'll read the resolution and then I'll start the time. So the resolution is, California community colleges should stop offering remedial courses. Starting time. Alright, so we'll start with some resolutional analysis. So this is basically describing what we will be doing today. So first, so the first is of a policy resolution. Now we'll be defining this as a as a policy a resolution because this defines an actor and should is a call to action. Now second, we'll be defining one definition, and that is of remedial. Now we're and now remedial in today's debate round it will be any um, course that is not considered to be transferable. So, um, and then our third point is of net benefits. Now, we will be weighing all of these um, um, arguments based on net benefits, seeing if post-plan um, um, we will be ad advantageous or disadvantageous, and we will be weighing um, ad ad advantages versus disadvantages. Now, our first background point will be of that remedial courses have the hugest bottleneck towards students. Now, students, uh, this is the hugest roadblock for, uh, for them because they are required to take work remedial courses in math and English, which many don't pass. And this is from the Public Policy Institute of California. And they, did, and, and they did a study on this. And so basically what this means is that kids who have gone from high school and did AP Stats or like AP Calc, and they go and they take that math um, test, a math, a, a, that math placement test, they like go into like math 20 or like math 25 like I did. So that's really not fair. And so post plan, we will be changing that. So, so, so the plan text is, California community colleges will stop offering remedial courses. Now our solvency point here is that um, basically what, what, what we will be providing um, is that we will be providing better education so that you as a student don't waste your time. So, 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 so let's go to our first ad advantage. And that's of bottlenecking. Now, and our first argument here is that the majority of people who take com 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 uh, com the majority of people who are community college students come here with the goal of transferring. Now, four out of five students, to be exact, come uh, come here, and that and that was of a U.S. Um, news and report um, in no in November 2015. Now, second is that the largest bottleneck or or reason that they stay longer, um, and they stay longer for two years, is because they have to take those. Uh, those are those remedial courses that they do not need. Now, and now the third point here is that this forces students to be here four years or more, and that is a lot. Just that sixty percent actually just drop out, and that was from the CC review in in twenty fifteen. So the fourth argument here is that this leads to a lack of education because they have to take these remedial courses, and because they cannot actually finish them, this leads to a to a dropout, and and, and this leads to, uh, to us not having the best education. So. Uh, uh, so, uh, so so let's go to our second advantage, and that is of cost. Now, and, and our first argument here is, is that only 39% of students um, who, um, who who go to these uh, community colleges graduate within six years. Now, a fourth of those who enroll uh, um, in fall don't come back in spring, and this is from the Heckinger Report in, in 2015. So, so we can see here is that because they can't um, go get into these one-on-one -on -one classes because they're stuck in the remedial classes, they don't actually come back. But the second point here um, is, is that staying an extra year, that the Complete College America estimates that an extra year of college costs $68,153. Now that's a lot of money, people. Now, and now the third argument here is that post-plan, we will take out those remedial courses. 
Now, the fourth argument here is that absent plan, more students will not come back. If you vote for, if you vote for the negative two, the students will not come back because they're stuck at this remedial course. Um, and then, um, and, and then, un, and then under this um, is that because of that, they get into more debt. So the fourth argument here is that we won't have the education that uh, that we need, but second of all, students will be in more debt. So, 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 so please vote affirmative. Thank you. Relate information to each other or argue a rebuttal. You guys have one minute of flex time. What was the original intent of having remedial classes? Um, the original intent of remedial classes, um, I would say, is that like for people who didn't really do well in high school, they could retake those classes again. But but specifically, what our plan is is doing is those who are taking like AP stats in in, um, in high school and then they test into math twenty, which is like. Um, elementary algebra, that's not fair because they don't graduate on time, thus costing more debt. So are you completely removing those lower classes that are necessary to learn those lower uh, educational classes? Yeah, it was previously believed that this allowed for a higher transfer rate because in theory, we thought it would help them catch up faster. But what the data is showing is that it actually keeps them here longer, four to six years to be exact, and that's why we're passing the permit. And does that higher transfer rate show that that is a higher educational level, or does that just mean that we're allowing more people to graduate? No, so the argument that we're making is that by having these remedial courses, it decreases the transfer rate. So, by passing the affirmative plan, we get rid of them, which we believe is going to be increasing the transfer rate, which helps with education and all the effects I've talked about previously. All right, one minute flight time is up. I now recognize the leader of opposition, Sean, for a constructive speech not to exceed more than five minutes. How's everyone doing today? Okay, this is a topic that I think we all have strong feelings about, so let's get into the negative case. The first contention here is uh, going to be called uh, being prepared for four years. So essentially remedial, remedial classes prepare students for the skills and opportunities for four year schools. The warrant under here is that it teaches skills that uh, students may be lacking. And like under here is the sub point. Like, Stanislaus and Sauce County has one of the lowest degree rates in the country. And the thing is, that's because students from here need to go through college and up to four-year universities and go on. And we need to be prepared. However, remedial classes are key for preparing students for the kinds of classes and skills they need. Think of math. Not everybody took AP stats when they were in high school. And some of these people might need to be refreshing their free algebra before they go on to take calculus. And so the impact is that if we pass the plan, if we get rid of remedial, uh, remedial classes, then we'll have worse education at the college level for schools like West Virginia College. And that means People in San Luis County, people in California will have worse job opportunities, which means you don't get a great job because you're not going to a trip for your college because you're not getting the remedial classes you need to get up there. Move on to Let's move on to counter contention too. This one is called, it's not the students that are failing, it's the high schools. Here's the, here's the thesis on this. High schools are failing to prepare their students for college. And look, this isn't our fault. Now, let's go over the warrants. A new report by the Center for Community College Student Engagement said 40% of students uh, averaged A's in high school, but still needed to brush up on remedial schools when entering, high, when entering college, which suggests that the skills are not being properly prepared for in high school. The second point here is that the Atlantic says that colleges and uh, community colleges enroll one third of U.S. undergraduates, and this is the first point of entry in the college system for millions, including 40 percent of low-income students. Community college is an important opportunity for all of us, and this is an opportunity in which we might need to be brushing up on some of the skills that our high schools simply did not give us. And my third point 
is that the National Education Association says that, rem that removing remedial classes disproportionately affects non-traditional students, that are, that's returning adults or veterans. It also disproportionately affects students who are low income or uh, students of color. The implications are if you remove these remedial classes, you are removing a stepping stone that we need to get to a good four-year college. Let's go on to top of case. Lydia made this example here, talking about uh, how she took an AP test and was still placed math 20. First, accept my argument that not everybody took AP math classes in high school. Some people might need to be taking pre-algebra, and that's okay. We need to develop these skills to succeed. But also, I'm not sure what she did, because I just sent my AP math test to the school. I went straight into calculus too, so did you send them? <laughs> argument called bottlenecking. <laughs> they say that the majority of students want to transfer, four-fifths, which means it sounds like four-fifths of the students want the skills that they are going to need to succeed in four-year uh, education, which means these students want to be prepared for the level of math and the level of English that they need. But furthermore, that means one-fifth of students want something else. They want an AA or they want a certificate. Things that, many of these things are not transferable. That means that the affirmative team wants one-fifth of the people going to community colleges to not get the kind of education they want because transferable is not good enough for them. They say it's a bottleneck. I say it's a path. And if the problem is that the path is too narrow, what we should be doing is expanding the path, not getting rid of it completely. And they say it forces students to be here for four years. I say it's better to be here for four years than go to a four-year college and drop out because you can't hang with calculus. One more argument on the argument of cost. They say it costs $68,000 a year for next year of college. Sure, maybe at a four-year university, it's cheap here. Let's retake classes here instead of four years. So when you fail here, it's going to be a heck of a lot cheaper. Okay. You guys now have a one minute flex time. How accurate would you say that community college placement tests are? I do not have the statistics for that. <laughs> Nor am I going to make them up. So, we don't know how many people that are placed into remedial classes actually are supposed to be in these remedial classes right now. I feel like if these individuals would, 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 would got placed below their skill level, they should succeed the remedial classes and move on very quickly. But wouldn't they be losing money by doing that and taking a class that they do not need? There may be some people who do that, but think of all the people who need the remedial classes and would miss out right. if you remove them. You're here. You're here. The affirmative is trying to benefit some people at the cost of many others. What was our criteria again? <laughs> no benefits. benefits. Exactly. So the majority. <laughs> I now recognize the member of government able for a constructive speech not to exceed longer than five minutes. Everybody, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to be going on the two counter contentions in order. The one being prepared for four years. Then we're going to be talking about students not failing. And, oh, students not failing. High school are failing. And then we're going to be going on the affirmative case in order. Bottlenecking, then cost. Let's go ahead and get started. The first point that the opposition makes is that remedial classes prepare you for college level courses. But this is just not true. Do you know what prepares you for college level courses? Taking college level courses in college. That prepares you for university level courses. In fact, this is not, not everyone took AP Calculus, and this is true. But, in fact, remedial courses do not help you at all. According to a study published on the Berkeley Policy Institute of Education, what actually happens is that when people who scored remedially on their entrance exam, they have the same pass rate 
on the college level courses as everybody else. The statistics just aren't on your side on this because the majority of these tests that are there for community colleges are wrong. In fact, according to an article in the Boston Globe, the majority of people that get placed into remedial classes don't deserve to be there. The tests are wrong, that makes you stay there for two or four more years and spend more money, money that the majority of us just do not have. The thing I didn't talk about is not the students failing. Now say that, they say that it's the high schools that are failing. And this is true, but we as students at the community college shouldn't have to pay for that with two more years of college. We shouldn't have to pay for that with more of our own money because the high schools failed us. And at the point at which the majority of people who get placed into college level courses succeed at the same level as those who tested into them originally, you're just gonna be losing money by taking these remedial courses. This is a key reason why we have to get rid of them. Because by getting placed into the college level courses, it incentivizes you to try harder. And we see this backed up with the statistic that it leads to the same level of actually passing the class as everybody else that actually tested into it. Next they say that National education says that removing remedial classes hurts the vulnerable, but we counter that with the statistic in terms of the Berkeley study, that these people score at the same level as those who were originally meant to be there. These vulnerable people are exactly why we need to pass the plan, because otherwise they're just going to be losing money, stuck into a system that's trying to keep them there to two to four more years just to make more money off of them. Now let's talk about bottlenecking. Now they say that four out of five people want to transfer and that they want skills to success. Having them in remedial classes that do them absolutely no good statistically, not to mention that we're taking their money, is not going to give them the skills that they want to succeed at a four-year university. At the point which four out of five people want to be at these four-year universities, we should get them up to par, ready to go within two years. Having remedial classes just does not do that. Next, they mentioned that one-fifth of people want AAs. AA classes are all college level transfer courses. If you want an AA, you have to take these level of classes. By sticking them into the remedial classes, they just take longer to get their AA. We're actually going to be solving back for this by decreasing the cost of getting an AA or any certificate that you're trying to get to get a better salary at your job, but we're also going to be increasing the amount of people that are going to be able to transfer. They completely fail to review any of the statistics. That point with 60% just drop out, instead of taking these remedial courses, we should give them the chance to prove themselves and to actually be able to graduate on time without having to spend that much money. Next, we come down to the cost. Now, they say that it's cheaper here, etc. But at the point at which, look, if you get placed into a college level course, despite being placed into the remedial through the test, you're probably still going to pass it at the same rate as everybody else. This is a key statistic within this debate because it just means that by sticking them into remedial classes, you're just gonna be keeping taking the class over and over again and failing it. Those people who get placed into remedial courses then tend to fail the remedial course, despite the statistics dictating that if they had been placed into the college level course, they would probably would have been higher chances of them passing it. This is just a loss of money every single year. And even if it's not 68,000, it's still a couple grand every single year. A grand that I personally don't have to spend on an extra year of college. I don't know if you guys do, but the majority of us sure do not. Which means that at the end of the day, by passing the affirmative, what you're going to be doing is that you're going to be increasing the amount of education that people have. The transfer rates are going to be increasing. And yes, while there are other people that perhaps can't do it, they have the same chance of graduating, they have the same chance of transferring as they would had they taken the remedial course. There's literally no reason to not at least give this a shot. There are other programs that can check back for these people. For example, we have adult schools that currently sit almost empty, which are actually focusing on trying to get people up to par to be able to graduate to these college level courses. At the end of the day, there's just way too many other things that are gonna be checking back for maybe 0.1% of the people that wouldn't excel at the college level course. There's literally zero reason to not pass the affirmative. The only thing that you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be decreasing the amount of time people have to spend at NJC, the amount of money that they have to spend at NJC, and there is no reason not to. For those reasons, I urge you to vote for the affirmative. You guys both now have 30 seconds of flex time.
Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, before we dive in, I have a question. How many of you had to go into remedial classes? All right. That's really good to know. All right. Let's dive right in. Talking about Abel's last speech and really why he assumed that these remedial classes are not important. But as we saw from the overall consensus of this room, they are important. And we'll be evaluating that throughout my speech. The first point that he responded to was the contention one of the negative team. He talked about how not true that taking college level courses prepares you. Basically that these remedial classes don't actually prepare you for college. But that is, again, not true. If you're not prepared for something, you can't succeed in it. If you're just thrown into the college level classes, you're not going to succeed. If I were thrown into a college level class right now, as I'm trying to take pre algebra, I would fail miserably. That's exactly why I was going to a remedial class. It's because I, I'm not going to admit this, I was homeschooled and I needed to go to the remedial class in order to prepare myself for college level classes. And that's exactly what remedial classes does. It's preparing you for those college levels. So you can completely ignore this argument by Abel because it's not true. Those remedial classes are important to succeeding in college. Now let's go down to this point of should not have to pay for that. Basically how we should not have to pay for what our college or our high schools fail to teach us. But that's the way things are. High school may not fully prepare you for college. And that's exactly what these remedial classes do. What high school failed to prepare you for, college is doing so. And that's exactly what MJC is doing for you. If you were homeschooled, if you didn't have the same education, if you went to a crummy high school, college can fix that with these remedial classes. It can help you get that level ground back so you can have a good experience in college. And should, and should, should have to fail or fall behind because they're thrown into these level of classes that they're not prepared for. Now let's move down to his point where he talks about the statistics from Berkeley. Now his point was talking, it wasn't looking at the average, it wasn't looking at you as the individuals, you students that need these remedial classes in order to succeed because some students very much need that in order to pass classes further on. Basic math is important in the future and that is exactly what these remedial classes do. They prepare you for the future by teaching you the basics that are necessary to succeed. Now let's move down. To, uh, my second response is people won't bother. If you remove remedial classes and don't teach them the basics, they're not going to even bother when it comes to college. They're not even going to make an attempt when it comes to college. Now let's move down to the point of not uh, uh, gaining the skills to succeed, but we've already kind of covered that. We, the whole basis of remedial classes is to teach you the basic necessary skills in order to succeed in college. So you can kind of throw his book behind that. Now let's talk about his point of AA transfer level, basically talking about how classes should be kept, they're going to allow you to transfer. But what about those work certificates? Students that are here to fulfill a class schedule so that they can get higher up in their job. There are a lot of reasons why we have remedial classes, not just AA for transfer classes. And re AA remedial classes are preparing other students that may want to just settle here or to move on to further on in other colleges. Now let's move down to the case I talk. Now the point that they brought said, no, no, that's not it. Let's move down to the advantage response. He said, he talked about the advantage and he really didn't respond to my partner's argument here talking about how this is a stepping stone. How remedial classes are actually stepping stones for students to succeed in college to use this necessary step in order to gain knowledge in college to actually get a degree. We need this stepping stone. And we really see this in English 101. You really need that basic knowledge in order to succeed when it comes to college. And to completely remove remedial classes would mean to put a lot of you at a major disadvantage. All of you that raised your hand before my speech, you would all be put at a disadvantage because the basic training that you're going to need to, to succeed in college is completely gone. And that is what the affirmative team is advocating for. They're advocating for less education for you as an individual. Now let's move down to uh, his response in the, to the cheaper education. He said they're still going to pass. But what we see is these remedial classes are necessary to an education. In order to succeed in the world, you need to have the basics of education, the basics of math and English. I was homeschooled and I came into this needing to understand math. And that is why I'm in a remedial class. That is why I'm learning the basics. Is so that when I get to college level, when I get to transfer out of here, I will have the basics so that I, I'm not drowning in college level math. I need those basics and you do as well. And that is why remedial classes are and so important. And that is why I encourage you to vote for the negative team. Thank you. I now recognize the leader of opposition, Sean, for a rebuttal speech not to exceed longer than two minutes.
All right, everyone, we are entering our last two speeches, and this is where you're going to hear the final reasons why you're going to be voting negative. And then the affirmative is going to come up, and you're going to be like, yeah, but I'm still voting negative. <laughs> so let's begin. What is going on here today is that our challenges in college is like a river we all have to cross. And the affirmative says, well, the bridge is too narrow. People are not getting across the bridge quickly enough. So what if we took out the bridge and made them swim? <laughs> getting rid of remedial classes is not about making your journey easier. They are taking a path. They are taking a stepping stone. They are taking an opportunity many of us need and removing it. And they say this is better for us? Dilly dilly! <laughs> Ultimately, what it comes down to is that it gives us the kinds of skills and opportunities we need to succeed. On to the second counter contention, specifically the, how ba basic maths are important. I'm taking college level math, and do you know where I make most of my mistakes? Simple algebra. <laughs> Zoe is taking what she calls remedial math. And why? Because if somebody told her that she had to start with pre-calculus, do you think she would go, oh, that's fantastic, I'm going to do wonderful in pre-calculus. <laughs> Many people, when faced with the lack of opportunity of remedial classes, when told that they have to go right into the gauntlet, when they have to swim right across that river, are going to stay home. <laughs> so the world of the affirmative is a world in which there is less education for all of us. It is a world in which there are less opportunities for all of us. And more importantly, with the argument that, the affirm that my partner talks about, work certificates are not college transferable, but they are essential for many people with getting good jobs and pay raises. And that's another reason to vote negative. You guys have 30 seconds to touch beneficial or not. But on the affirmative team, we have seen a lot of statistics that went unrefuted by the negative team, meaning those are true. And with that said, let's get down to our first contention, or, or their first a, 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 a contention. Now, there's been a, a, a lot of back and forth about whether remedial classes actually prepare students for skills that they need. Now, the last argument here was that if, you, if, if you're not prepared, you won't succeed. But the Berkeley study that my partner referred to said that students who went who, who, who had scored in remedial classes had the same success rate as transferable classes, meaning the 100 classes, the 105 classes. They have the same success rate. So why are you going to do the remedial courses if you can succeed at the bigger ones? There's just no um, logic that is there. And so, and, and then my partner referred to the Boston Globe about how those remedial uh, uh, placement tests they are wrong, so we're spending useless money that we could be spending on other things. If, if these remedial courses do not help us with our skills either way. But with, uh, but with their second con uh, convention, now they talked about how it's not the students, but, uh, uh, but it's the high school's fault. And my, and, my, and my partner says that, well, you shouldn't have to pay, because we pay $68,000 um, each, 
each year. But the Boston Loop says these, these tests are wrong. We should not have to go through these remedial courses. I took um, AP Calc in high school. I was homeschooled too. I taught myself AP Calc, and then when I went into, um, and, then, and then when I took the math okay, the test, I got into elementary algebra. Now, now that specifically is not fair to myself because my mother taught me. So really, I, I do not need that remedial course. So it is not true that we need these remedial courses. But um, let's go down to, to, to our advantage about bottlenecking. Now, and now, and now we keep saying is that is that these four out of five students, uh, they, uh, they can get their AA, but in order to get your AA, you need those transferable courses, not remedial courses. So we still do not need these remedial courses, but also they never refuted the argument that my partner uh, uh, brought up is that these students are dropping out. 60% are dropping out because they get into these remedial courses and they do not succeed. We do not need these remedial courses that are taking our time. Time. But let's get to the cost, which is a huge one. Now they keep saying remedial is a stepping stone, remedial is necessary, but it's not because adult schools can check back. But also, my partner talked about the Berkeley study, which went unrefuted. These statistics are huge, is that we have the same success rate, and so we don't need these remedial courses. So at the end of the day, because we are net beneficial, because four out of student, four out of five students want to transfer, and they want to not be in those rem remedial courses, we are net beneficial. And you will be voting for the affirmative team in today's debate round. So vote affirmative. Thank you. I've got a handy decimal meter here on my phone. We're going to introduce each team, and if you feel that they won the debate, just let loose and let me hear your excitement. So, at the end of the round, when you look at the arguments, if you feel the negative team has proven that we ought to reject this resolution, let me hear you out. decimals is the number to be. If you feel the affirmative team has convinced you all that we ought to um, affirm this resolution, go ahead and let me hear you now. Yeah. 